things started, obviously we'll do some introductions that we can get going as more people join us. But I um, want to let everybody know, I'm Aaron Magee. I'm the VP for North America at Mo Engage, and I'm your host of today's live webinar called Lean AI to Fuel Mobile Growth. So I'm really excited to be chatting with Lomit Patel, VP of Growth at IMVU. Uh, Lomit's responsible for user acquisition, retention, and monetization. He's a public speaker, advisor, and has been recognized as a mobile hero by Liftoff. Hey, Lomit, welcome to the webcast. Given your title at IMVU, I'm guessing you know something about mobile and mobile growth. So love to find out, kind of jump into the main topic of the webinar. I mean, how does AI fit into you know, growth strategy and, and what should people that are listening right now think about uh, think about utilizing that for? Yeah, so, you know, uh, when it comes to growth, it, it's all about growing a business. And, you know, generally you have specific goals that, that you're striving to sort of measure what that success is, whether it's acquiring new customers or, or driving new revenue. And so uh, the key to, to success in growth marketing is to really accelerate your rate of learning through running as many A-B experiments across the entire customer funnel to quickly figure out what's working and what's not. And the benefit of AI in this day and age is now, you know, we we have more data than at our disposal than, than, than we used to have before. It's really hard to sort of process that data to really figure out the insights in terms of what what actions you really want to take and that's mm -hmm. where ai really comes in and helps because ai enables you to exponentially increase your rate of learning because it can process that data better faster and smarter to surface insights that you can kind of take to really enable you to pivot into running um those tests and and really um you know taking the uh, making the decisions that that you need to continue to grow your business which doing it you know w without ai you, you'll get bogged down by just trying to do this humanly with, with which is really impossible yeah well i guess i'm curious what do you you know i talk to people all the time that are saying hey we're just getting started with ab testing i mean ai is really taking it to the next level correct i mean it's it's really ab testing on steroids is that a good way to think of it it is yeah uh, and another way to think about it is uh, you know, generally when it comes to AI, because you're kind of limited by how many AI tests you can do, you know, you you generally try to prioritize what are the tests that we're going to end up doing for this month, as an example. And 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 a lot of that is to to a lesser extent based on people's opinions, right? To treat, hey, we're going to prioritize these tests mm -hmm. for this month. With AI, uh, instead of having that conversation with your team to try and sort of figure out, you know what we want to prioritize you don't that conversation kind of goes away because you can you can just run the entire gamut of the different tests you want to run because you won't be limited by bandwidth to try and execute on it got it okay got it so when it when it comes to mobile growth in particular and obviously mobile growth there's you know there's a lot of subcategories right there's acquisition there's retention and engagement which is the business that we're in um, there's obviously making sure that you've got you know, ongoing lifecycle marketing, even potentially some recapturing or retargeting if you've got people that you've lost trying to get them back. I mean, ultimately, what are some of these specific questions that AI can solve for mobile growth? So for for me, you know, you know, the two key questions that AI can can solve re really comes down to how do you how can you spend your budget your user acquisition budget more efficiently because everybody mm -hmm. has an acquisition bus budget when they work in growth but the challenge is is for the most part you know you're you're always under pressure to try and spend that efficiently and 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 and, and to try and hit certain goals whether it's acquiring new customers or a return on ad spend and then and so you know ai can really help you uh, to to get to to spend that money more efficiently just because it can surface all those insights, right? That will help you to get smarter. And then the second part, the other challenge that most growth teams have is just resource constraints, especially on a team in terms of executing a lot of these different experiments and tests and managing campaigns. Again, you know, uh, you know, having AI and automation you know, it en enables you to be able to do a lot more with less resources. So it, right. it enables your team to just be more efficient. Okay, got it. So 
What about misconceptions? Because, I mean, you hear AI kind of thrown around pretty haphazardly. I mean, kind of, you know, my, my toaster has AI, right? Or my refrigerator. Um, but I mean, obviously for the topic of this webinar on mobile growth, I mean, what are the most kind of common misconceptions that you see about AI and, and its use cases? Sure. Um, but before I answer, Erin, I'm curious to kind of hear, hear your perspective, because, you know, in terms of what are some of the things that you run into as, as misconceptions? Yeah, I, th I think it's I think it's uh, that's a great question. I think for me, one of the things that we run into a lot is misconceptions about really where's the where's the level of effort need to be placed. Right. Is it? In, and I know that you're going to talk a little bit about data and all that stuff, but it's, you know, a lot of it's getting to. Um, oh, geez, how do I say it? I mean, it, you know, it's like, well, what's the difference between machine learning and AI, right? And, you know, is is where should where should I really be investing AI resources? Is it, you know, for us, for example, like we're doing time-based send optimization and predictive segmentation and, um, you know, content optimization, which I think are really solid use cases. But a lot of times people are saying, well, I wanted to just create the content for me, right? I wanted to, I mean, the, They've kind of seen what's out there on the bleeding edge, and they're they're asking for you know I want to with every push notification I send out I want it to be graphical and I want the image to be perfectly tied to the psychographic profile of the person that's being sent to right and I just I just don't feel that we're uh, in some of those use cases that we're quite there yet but I'm just curious of what you know what are the ones you you can talk about so yeah you know from my perspective and I, and I can just talk because you know I kind of went through this you know trying trying to champion and implement AI in in my company uh, you know I think the you know the biggest uh, misconception is really you know is is really the unknown right because because there's so many different stories that are flying out uh, you know every, every day you you're reading about hey a AI can do this or AI is impacting you know some, somebody's job or AI is like when it comes to self-driving, hey, somebody like suddenly died in a car that was like yeah, AI driven. Yeah. You know, I I feel ultimately it's all about there's there's a lot of noise out there, but but the misconception really happens when you know if if you don't really sort of set clear use cases in terms of what you want to solve with with AI to start off with based on your own business. You know, and and once you have clear use cases, and and the idea is to really start off with with instead of trying to think of really big elaborate things that can happen think of what what are the immediate low hanging fruit things that you can do kind of the quick wins to really get people more excited and and and, and get them more on board to really support a project like this because ultimately you know the challenge is really how much is it going to end up costing us in the long run, and and how much resources are really going to go into this, and 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 is this going to end up becoming a distraction to the original business that we're yeah. trying to run? So I feel you know in you know you know by by really you know educating users on some clearly defined use cases and really you know planning out exactly how, you know what how do you define success on those use cases and and ensuring to make sure you know the the other challenge is really build versus buy right and, you know i feel a lot of companies kind of you know feel like uh you know which path to take on that you know i feel you know especially in this day and age there's so many great platforms out there that have some form of ai built into it you know so you know there's no need to really go and build something you know you can at least starting out go and leverage what's out there that way you can fast forward and learn a lot quicker and, and get some wins under the belt and mm -hmm. from there you know uh once you have more confidence from from the broader uh, spectrum of people in the company then then you can sort of think about hey you know once you've once you've tapped that out what what are some of the next things that we'd want to do and does it do we really need to build this or not but yeah, ultimately okay. but you know i feel it's really you know just uh, just just starting off with kind of clearly defining the use case and and, and what success looks like Okay. Uh, any other like mistakes or roadblocks, common things you see people make while they're adopting it? The most common mistake is not getting all your data integrated into one place, especially in the cloud, so that 
your AI can have access to good real-time data to make actionable insights. And that was actually something, you know, when I started here at MView, you know, I mean, the great thing at MView is we have a lot of data. Uh, the the downside was it lived in a lot of silos and in a lot of different places because we have, you know, data and users that are coming from our desktop app and, and, and then we had data coming from our mobile app. So mm-hmm. we had to try and create an, uh, a unified view to really understand our users across platforms. So starting, you know, you know but by by integrating data into one place is 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 probably the most important step because without having good data you you're pretty much feeding bad data signals into your AI which is ultimately going to lead to bad outcomes yeah got it okay well i know that you've got a framework um, that you've kind of put together to really leverage AI in a startup so why don't we pull that up take a look and you can kind of walk us through that sound good sure yeah, great. All right. Let's see if we can make technology work. There we go. Cool. And then you can just prompt me to uh, um, just change the screen if need be. So. Right. So, 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 so this is the um, the framework that we had developed when we came up with the concept of creating an intelligent AI machine at MView. Uh, the the genesis here is really going back to what I'd mentioned earlier. You know, the key the the key to success and growth is really about trying to run as many experiments as you can at scale to really figure out what works and what doesn't work. And what we wanted to do was, you know, you know, you know, we, we started working with a number of different partners, whether that was like Facebook, Google, or, or or other DSP partners that already have AI integrated into their platforms in some way, shape, or form. The um the, but and so we were able to get some, you know, once we had all our data integrated and we were passing them the right data events, you know, they started doing a you know, a pretty good job for us. But one thing that became abundantly clear to us was how dependent we were on our partners sort of telling mm-hmm. us how much we should be spending with them. And I don't know about you, but I've never worked with any partner that wants to take less money from us, right? And say, <laughs> <"Good to somebody laughs> else. so, you know, with that, and then, you know, you know, the other thing that was on the, on the back of, back of my mind is just a risk, right? It's like, you know, uh, you know, being so highly dependent on any one partner, whether that's Facebook and Google, with, you know, who again have been scrutinized and going through all this regulatory and all of these other f- external things that are happening. Like, if any one of them blow up and, and you're so dependent on them, you, your business is probably going to blow up along with them. And mm-hmm. so, and so, what what we found out is that ultimately, you know. You know, there's certain inputs like bids, budgets, creatives, uh, and, and goals that that you, that you have a lot of control over because you need to feed all of that information into these partners, and you can actually uh, change those levers based on performance. But most people don't do that; they just leave it up to these partners to sort of you know uh, change bids and budgets, and you sort of trust they're going to do the right thing. And um, mm-hmm. what we so what you know what we ended up doing was basically automating all of those inputs like the bids the budgets and and uh-huh. uh, and and in the middle you know you know as I talked about you know, integrated all of our data sources into one place mm-hmm. and so once we had our data in one place we were able to have a holistic view across all of the different channels so you know the big difference is that you know when we were sharing data with Facebook Facebook only knew how they were doing compared to the data that we were giving them on themselves. They had no idea how Google was doing or how uh, any a DSP partner or any other partners that we were spending money would, but we had that data. So we, we kind of had the holistic view. And so in this intelligent machine, we ended up building a layer that sat between us and all the different partners that we were, that we were working with, but we were able to pull the strings uh, based on data to automate whether we wanted to increase the bids or we wanted to decrease bids based on how performance was happening in real time. And I think, you know, the, the key message on this is that, you know, on the outputs, you know, we clearly defined what our goal was, which was to optimize towards um, our uh, cost per acquisition uh, mm-hmm. on, on a customer and a return on ad spend, and and so you know we clearly define that those those as being the outcomes that we wanted our AI and 
machine to optimize towards. So based on those goals and all of the the, the data and all of uh, that was going into it, it was able to differentiate between this between um, sig between insightful signals and the noise to really take the actions to automate changing all the inputs that across the different partners that that we were spending money with to help us hit our goals. And and okay. what we and what we ended up finding is that you know you know this works really well because most of the media or most most of the partners that you work with are all programmatically uh, set up as exchanges. So at any given time, you know there could be more competition in any one partner and maybe not in another. But you don't really you don't really know that unless you have someone who can sort of change bids in real time, which is what we can do now to yeah. try and hit this hit. Okay, cool. Should I go to the next? Uh, yeah. Yeah. And 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 so now, you know, before we had the intelligent machine, you know, mm-hmm. we, we were able to run, you know, maybe a, a hundred or, or so experiments a month across like creatives and um, and audiences, but now with the intelligent machine, we've been able to increase our velocity to run in uh, thousands of different experiments a, a month across different wearables because we're able to change our bids. In, in, in it's in, in based on performance, we're able to um, figure out you know what's the right creative to get truly closer to 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 providing a personalized experience by. By, by trying to target the user with the right creative at the right mm-hmm. time, that's going to get them to take the action. And, um, and and then we're able to allocate our budgets across different platforms. So so basically, you know, you know, we're now, uh, just by increasing our velocity of learning, we've gotten better and smarter around um, what works and what doesn't work. That, that used to take us a lot longer before. Oh, okay, cool. Well, yeah, and, I, got, and, I see the next slide is, uh, you know, driving retention. So I'd love to hear you talk about that. Everybody's, you know, obviously we deal with that all day long. So I'd love to hear your thoughts. Right. And, and, and just to preface this is, you know, uh, you know, you know, retention is really important to growth at the end of the day. It doesn't matter how many people you bring in, if you're not going to keep them around, then, right. you know, then, then, then you've just got a huge leaky bucket. And, and so for us, right from the start, you know, we've always think about growth as focusing on both acquisition and retention. And so when it came to retention, one of the things uh, we were able to do with our AI was to really identify what's the optimal uh, user journey that somebody takes that leads mm-hmm. them to becoming our best lifetime value customer. And and so we basically, uh, you know, uh, with AI, we were able to, again, break that down systematically into different actions or behaviors that users were taking within the first seven days because as you know Aaron on mobile people don't have a uh, a huge um, attention span you have to really right. act fast to really get them to uh, to experience the aha moments in your product quickly and so once we were able to break that down here uh, you know you know it, it basically came down to messaging in them with 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 with, with different call to actions which for MView, you know, it started off with, because we give everybody uh, like 4,000 free MView credits. It's really mm-hmm. important for somebody to redeem those credits because what, because because outside of creating an avatar, once they redeem their credits, then, then that gets them more engaged because in order to redeem those credits, it requires them to spend it and customize the avatar, which, which, which is important. Once they customize the avatar, then the next step is to try and get them to make friends. So we start, you know, uh, encouraging them to mm-hmm. engage in our chat rooms. Uh, and and once they start engaging in chat rooms, then it's a matter of, uh, you know, uh, socializing more with their friends or going shopping with their friends, and then, uh, you know, sharing sharing their experiences on our social feed. But but there are all of these different loops that once somebody goes through these. Then, then it's going to lead to them being more engaged, uh, higher retention, and ultimately we're able to monetize them better. Yeah. And so the big difference um, that that we ended up doing with AI is outside of our different CRM um, channels that we have, whether that's email, push, in-app, uh, and we also have our own like chat 
mechanism okay. in MVU. We also um, layered on uh, retargeting ads for a DSP partner. So that's where, you know, based on these actions, we were passing all these events back to a DSP partner to nice. start targeting those users. Because ultimately, you know, we wanted to make sure that uh, our users were really seeing these messages. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Well, that's we've got experience doing that as well with customers using yeah. our platform to, you know, advance users through. I call it the value ladder, right? Like increasing yeah. steps of value, yeah. and um, and and making make it work. Yeah. All right. Well, let's. So we've got the final slide here, just talking about, you know, the the outcome. So love to talk. Have you talk through that? Sure. Yeah. So so ultimately, you know, it's it all comes down to results, and so. Uh, the three phases here, the old way was when we really, that's when I joined MVU and our data was in silos. So you could clearly see it was, it was really a challenge to even sort of make a lot of progress on on trying to uh, hit our goals. The new way was once we started working with a number of these different partners who already had AI capabilities and, and we had our data integrated so we were able to pass the right data signals over to them that we started to see some 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 decent success but ultimately we started to hit a flat line you know and and that's when you know once we sort of pivoted over building our own ai intelligent machine that sat between us and and and, and holistically managed all of our different channels from acquisition to retention you could clearly see that we've continued to see wins and and the great news is we still haven't hit a flat line and, yeah. and and in the grand scheme of things, you know, from where we started to where we are right now, we've seen over a three x improvement on our return on ad spend and a three x uh, decrease in our cost to acquire a customer. But the best way to sort of put this into perspective um, is, you know, uh, you know, most most growth teams ultimately look at what's your payback period on on the money you spend in. And so for us, you know, it used to be like maybe like four to six months when we first started doing it the old way. Now we recoup the majority of our acquisition spend within 30 days. So it's been a huge okay. shift. Okay, well, that's great. That's very cool. Thanks for sharing. Welcome. Um, what, um, you know, any, I guess, you know, Anything else you want to share? I mean, on this, I mean, you know, we're getting close to the half hour. I want to make sure that we've got time for some Q and A. So, is there any other kind of closing thoughts you want to uh, want to bring up as, re as relates to this before we jump to questions? Um, so, so what I would bring up is that you know, uh, you know, that be that we're in a new decade now. So, we need to really think about what are going to be the right tools to really help us in growth. Really be successful and trying to sort of use the tools of like the last decade, you know, or, or, you know, isn't going to be the way forward. And yeah. ultimately, you know, uh, you know, the companies that can kind of pivot into, into AI, even if it's baby steps, start doing it now because, because you're going to be a way ahead of the curve before anybody else starts doing it. Cause most people are pretty slow to adopt to this. Yeah. And, and the other part of it is, you know, you'll continue to learn just like us. You know, we ended up learning. It wasn't like we, we everything we did was successful. But 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 once we had the infra infrastructure in place and we had the right data, again, d data is your biggest competitive advantage. You know, the question is, how are you going to use that data to to help you um, be successful? Because data by itself is isn't going to isn't useful. It's it's taking the data and 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 extracting the insights. So yeah, yeah fair point. I agree yeah. with that. Well, I, that's I, for our platform, right? I mean, you know, we've we've got customers that are using that, that are slow to get started, but once they get started, they kind of get into that rhythm, right? Where they're creating six different variants of an email and letting our AI technology optimize for the conversion rate and then or optimize for the time to send. So I just want to pull up like some stats. Like we've had customers that you know, kind of across the board, 22% higher click rates, 10% higher conversions. Um, when it comes to actually optimizing, and that's for the content. And so, so they'll go through and they'll do six different variants, find the winner, and then they and then they do another exercise, find the winner, and they start to zero in on where is that inflection point where they can really drive superior results just because they've learned from their customers, right? It's really cool to see. I mean, I actually had one, I had one newspaper who was sending out news alerts 
and they would actually use AI to basically tell them what the what the audience wanted to see, right? They'd send six different alerts, and then they started kind of coding them on: is this you know local? Is it sports? Is it whatever? And it was just a very interesting experiment for them to use it in that way. Um, but we've also seen, um, I'm just looking at my screen here, for our send time optimization. So basically being able to optimize when we send out messages. Yeah. We've seen 35% higher click-through rates on push notifications and, as a result, 14% higher conversion. So even just getting that timing right in addition to the content can make a huge difference. Yeah, I definitely agree with you. You know, uh, you know. I mean, just taking the example of send time optimization, the reality is we all, you know, most businesses are global and we live in different time zones. The, you know, trying to sort of just send something in, you know, across the board just doesn't make a lot of sense. You got to really, but beyond just sending it, you want to really send it when you know somebody's actually active on their phone, right? Mm -hmm. And, and I, don't know, I don't know you and, you know, other people that have that capability is huge because at the end of the day, you know, you, a message is useless unless somebody actually sees it. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Well, hey, Loma, I appreciate your insight. Um, this has been really helpful for me just to kind of bring bring me into your world a little bit. Um, I'd love to, uh, you know, I know that there's a lot of stuff that is there's probably in the new book. So is there, I mean, do you want to give us kind of a quick rundown of, of what the book's about just so, you know, folks kind of know what to expect? Sure. Um, so Lean AI uh, is, the book's pretty much about providing practical advice to companies who can scale up growth significantly faster when you combine a lean team with a judicious use of artificial intelligence and automation. You know, so a lot of the things that I kind of talked about today, but but you know, anybody that's really interested in that and, and wants to really figure out, you know, how you can champion AI within your corporate within your business, you know, how do you get started? And 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 then how do you how do you go from like the bare minimum of leveraging AI to the most advanced form of using AI, where mm -hmm. AI is fully automated and it's and it's pretty much using all of your data and and coming up with different predictions and taking actions um, um, autom automatically. So you, so there's no real manual in, yeah. intervention involved. That's kind of kind of the stage where you know where I here and so i kind of talk about that entire journey you know that of, of what it takes to get to that okay awesome well let me take a look and see what questions we have coming in because we'll jump to questions um but certainly appreciate the feedback so i guess first one here is somebody talking about startups right in a typical startup team you get a small team um you know basically i've just started out i don't have data <laughs> I guess what are some of the steps they take towards having a central unified view of their customers from a from a tech perspective? So, um, you know, I feel that that you need to um, get your data integrated, right? Because if you don't really have your data integrated, uh, then it then none of the other things are really gonna matter. Because because if you use bad data then you're going to get bad outcomes and you're not going to really end up hitting your goal. You know, but, you know, to, you know, I, I just feel in this, you know, you know, every company has data, you know, because if you're selling something, you're getting some kind of data on your users. It, it's, it's just a matter of trying to, trying to make sure you're capturing the right data. But, you, you know, there's two ways when it comes to like AI and Aaron, I, I'm sure you know this too. When it comes to machine learning, there's two 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 forms of machine learning. There's either like structured learning or unstructured learning. And so, you, you know, if you know, with us, we generally lean more towards unstructured learning because they, you know, you can just you can pile a bunch of data into it and and let the machine kind of extract it to come up with insights that you can't really figure out. If there's certain things that you already know that are working. And then, then you can, can you know, then, then you can kind of put it into like stru structured learning, and it will kind of rinse and repeat to try and hit you those specific outcomes. But you know, I feel for you know a company starting out, you know, unstructured learning is a great way to just even even be able to get the, those insights that you're looking to. And you know, in this day and age, you don't even need to build this. You know, you know, Aaron, like you guys have a great platform, and there's there's a bunch of other AI capable platforms out there that you can kind of lean on just to try and help you get started. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that's cool. Thank you. Well, I guess we got 
looking at the clock, we got time for one more. Um, this one is in a typical team. Um, where does the ownership of AI really lie, right? Is it PMs? Is it engineers? Is it the cold growth thing? Um, and, you know, kind of how do you pull the right team together? Or again, is it an individual that leads it and then kind of drives everybody else? So, um, so what's kind of worked for us, you know, the reality is, you know, it, it takes a number of different teams to really support AI from product and data to really mm -hmm. get the right nuts and bolts in place. However, the team that's really on the hook at the end of the day to really drive results and is your growth team, right? So, so, so that, so it makes a lot more sense to have the growth team kind of be the team that's kind of championing in the the AI and and ov overlooking it. But one other thing that's important, you know, to have is is some kind of executive sponsor that's really going to get behind this project. Okay. You know, whether that's a CEO or chief operating officer, someone who ultimately can can ensure that you're not going to be just running run into a lot of resistance because that happens when it comes yeah. to change. <laughs> Yeah, got it. Cool. Well, hey, we've, uh, you know, really appreciate the insights and the time. Lomit, thank you very much. I think we're, we, you know, let's definitely wrap this up. And uh, I know that you and I will chat, chat again, maybe, maybe live with a bunch of people watching, maybe one on one, but certainly appreciate your inputs. And, uh, and thanks to everybody for joining today. Hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you bet. Take care.